Wesley went up to Oxford in July of 1728. And by the way, you always go up to Oxford. You never go down to Oxford. If you talk about going down to Oxford, they know you're not from around here. <laughs> so Wesley went up to Oxford in July of 1728, where he remained for a few months. And he was ordained a priest in the Church of England on September 22nd uh, of that year by Dr. Potter. This is the same bishop uh, who had ordained him deacon earlier. Okay? Uh, and shortly after his ordination as a priest, uh, Wesley returned to Epworth and to Root to assist his father uh, in pastoral duties. In the meantime, Charles Wesley, Charles Wesley, his younger brother, was pursuing his studies at Christ Church. Um, and in May of 1729, uh, John Wesley had learned of uh, some of the uh, activities that were taking place uh, with a small group at Oxford, and Charles was very much a, a part of, of this, uh, along with William Morgan and Robert Kirkham. Uh, and so uh, we can see uh, in this report that John Wesley had received from his brother Charles in May of 1729, this small group fellowship with Charles Wesley, with William Morgan and with Robert Kirkham that the seeds of what later will become, shortly, Oxford Methodism are, are arising here, okay? Um, now, uh, in a letter dated October 21st, 1729, Dr. John Morley, uh, who was the rector of England, pointed out to Wesley that it was necessary for teaching fellows, remember what John Wesley was elected a fellow of Lincoln, it was necessary for them to fulfill their duties in person, not in absentia. So where was John Wesley? He's with his father. He's with his father in Epworth and Root. Where should he be? He's supposed to be at Oxford because he was elected uh, you know, at Lincoln and was a, a teaching fellow. And so Dr. John Morley writes his, him this letter and reminds him. And so Wesley, after receiving the letter, he heads up to Oxford in November 1729. And he, along with his brother Charles, and William Morgan continued where they had left off during the summer by meeting on a regular basis, meeting on a regular basis, and by striving to keep the precepts of the university. Uh, soon Robert Kirkham uh, joined their number again. Uh, and so we have here this little band, the very seeds of, of Oxford Methodism here, um, and this little band, as you might imagine, stood out. They stood out because they were earnest, they were serious, and the other students looked at them with some degree uh, of suspicion. And so they were referred to derisively as the Holy Club, the Godly Club, Bible Moths, Bible Moths, because they're always in a Bible, uh, here's, here's a mouthful for you, super erogation men, super erogation men. Oh, what does that mean? Uh, it means doing much more than is necessary. Uh, super erogation literally means to work above, to do above uh, what is called for, what is necessary. Uh, the, the term Methodist came later when John Bingham of Christ Church observed that there is a new set of Methodists uh, sprung up amongst us. Um, 
There's actually some dispute among scholars as to the origin of the term Methodist and its referent, what it was referring to when it was first coined. I'm not going to get into that, uh, just to say that the term is being used. Uh, it's being used at this time, uh, and it's referring to this small band of people, which we just mentioned, who are earnest Christians in the context of university life. Our Methodism grows up in the context of Oxford University, okay? Um, and that's where it will flow. So whatever the source of the term Methodist, we're not going to get into that. Those called by this name eventually came to include such people as, of course, John and Charles Wesley, John Clayton, John Clayton, George Whitfield, George Whitfield, that may be a name that you've heard before, George Whitfield was very much involved in the revival, uh, the revival that's taking place uh, in 18th century England. Um, and what you should understand is that the revival uh, in 18th century England, due in large measure to George Whitfield, is a what? A transatlantic phenomenon meaning that it's happening in England and Wales, um, and, but it's also happening in, uh, it's happening in the, the colonies. Uh, it's happening in you know, America, uh, especially as George Whitfield comes uh, and preaches, uh, and he begins in New England, and he makes his way, and he goes, and he preaches till he gets to the south, uh, George Whitfield had established an orphanage uh, in Georgia. That was uh, a ministry that was dear to his heart. Uh, of the two, uh, George Whitfield, no doubt, was the greater preacher. Uh, George Whitfield had a reputation uh, for being a great preacher. Um, he came from a background where he was involved with the theater theatrical uh, uh, exhibitions. He had that training, that knowledge. Uh, his speech, his elocution was very good. Um, and even Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, the, the American statesman, uh, who was a deist, uh, you know, that would be the proper way, I think, to speak about his faith. But even his curiosity was piqued by George Whitfield. And so he went out to hear George Whitfield preach. And you know what his advice was, uh, Benjamin Franklin? He said, if you ever go hear George Whitfield preach, make sure you have no money in your pockets. <laughs> Why? Because you will give all your money to George Whitfield. Uh, and so he recounts in his own writings, Benjamin Franklin, listening to George Whitfield, and Whitfield, of course, raising funds for the orphanage. And so Whitfield says, well, you know, I can give him the coppers, and so I'll throw the coppers in, and he hears George Whitfield some more. Well, you know, I suppose I can throw in the silver, so he throws in the silver, and then he listens to George Whitfield some more, and then uh, he says, oh, take the whole lot, and he, he gave George Whitfield all the money that he had on him. Um, George Whitfield was such a powerful preacher, um, his reputation preceded him, and it is reputed that he could make women cry uh, just with the pronunciation of the word Mesopotamia. <laughs> <laughs> so he had quite, quite a reputation, quite a reputation, um, uh, and he was he was the one, really, uh, in, a, in a great degree, who sewed these revivals together, happening in England and Wales, and also happening in America. Um, okay. Now, Wesley's later reflections on the rise of Oxford Methodism are also significant because in them, he underscores the importance of being a scriptural Christian 
where the Bible for him constitutes the basic standard or the norm of his life. In his plain account of Christian perfection, for example, uh, he states, in the year 1729, I began not only to read, but to study the Bible as the one, the only standard of truth and the only model of pure religion. And then elsewhere, uh, Wesley wrote in his sermon on God's vineyard, from the very beginning, from the time that four young men, who are those four young men? He's thinking of Oxford Methodism. Four young men united together. Each of them was determined to be, what were they determined to be? I'll put it up on the screen here, the board, homo, Unius, homo unius libri. And what that translates, that Latin phrase, homo unius libri, uh, a person of one book, a person of one book. Now, that doesn't mean that John Wesley only read one book or that he only read the Bible. That, that would not be the case at all. As you already have a sense earlier, John Wesley read widely. He's constantly reading and he's reading in different areas, okay? But what he means by this phrase, homo unius libri, is that the Bible is at the center, it's at the center of all learning. It's at the center of all learning uh, and, and all knowledge. Okay, so in that sense, he is a person of one book. So for example, you know, in theology, <clears throat> we think of two sources of knowledge. We think of revelation, that which we receive from the word of God, from scripture, okay? We have that avenue of knowledge, but we also have reason. So we have reason and revelation, okay? And in their best sense, they, those two do not conflict uh, because all truth is God's truth, as you've heard, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so if revelation, meaning scripture, and I'm thinking of Genesis, I'm thinking of Romans here, uh, if they reveal that all of this has been created by God, okay? Then when I look out, I don't simply see nature, which I of course see, I do see nature, but, and here's the difference, and this is an example of homo unius libri, I also see what? Creation. I also see creation. Uh, and that is the proper understanding. Oh, and by the way, if you think you can't look out upon nature and see creation as if somehow science disproved that, that's an intellectual error. You've made a mistake. You've made a philosophical mistake. We can correct that. We can correct that. Uh, there are two sources here, uh, revelation and reason, okay? We know that behind this is God. How do we know? By revelation. We know that through scripture. And so, uh, there are some who say, we can't say that. All you can talk about is nature. Well, the Bible, revelation is at the center. So if something, some human knowledge contradicts revelation, guess what? Guess what? Revelation is correct. Revelation is appropriate, okay? okay. Uh, and some Christians have been too timid in this area. I, I'm not timid in this area. I've studied philosophy extensively, and, uh, and if, if we think as Christians we cannot look out and see creation, we've been robbed. We've been robbed better than any thief could ever rob us, okay? And so don't get, all, don't get off the story. Don't get off the story. Both end. Yes, reason. Of course, reason. But, of course, revelation. Not simply nature, but also revelation, okay? And 
When we say homo unius libri, we mean then that the Bible is the norm. It is the standard. It is the standard. It is the norming norm, if you will. Okay. Um, now, as you might imagine, the early Methodists were mocked. They were mocked by fellow students. Um, they were, the Wesleys and others were concerned to be Bible Christians, uh, but they were mocked. Uh, they were uh, called Bible moths and also called Bible bigots, Bible bigots. Uh, and so they received that kind of, that kind of censure, uh, that kind of censure. Um, towards the end of 1734, uh, Samuel Wesley, his health is declining. He's getting older. Uh, his health is slipping away. Uh, he's becoming more sickly. And so uh, Susanna becomes concerned. Uh, and Samuel as well in terms of the future. And Samuel, as a good husband, wants to make sure that his wife is adequately prepared for when he's gone. Okay? Uh, and so the elderly rector uh, made some overtures to John Wesley uh, to take over his parishes. What were the parishes? You already know. Epworth and Root. Uh, so the father said, John Wesley, will you take over these parishes? That way, Susanna could continue to live there in the rectory and she could be provided for. And so Samuel Sr. was trying to make provision for his wife, knowing that his days were, were numbered, so to speak. Okay? Um, and so uh, John Wesley, in response to his father, says no. Says, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And so in November 1734, uh, John Wesley writes to his father, quote, wherever I can be most holy myself, there I am assured I can most promote holiness in others. But I am equally assured there is no place under heaven so fit for my improvement as Oxford. So what is Wesley saying there? He's saying that I want to stay at Oxford. Why? Because Oxford is conducive. It's helping me to grow in the knowledge and love of God. It's helping me uh, to become a better Christian, okay? Uh, and so, when Samuel receives this response, he's stunned, he's surprised that John Wesley doesn't want to take these parishes of Epworth and Root. And here's how he responds to John Wesley. He's very direct, quote, it is not dear self, but the glory of God and the different degrees of promoting it, which should be our main consideration and direction in the choice of any course of life. So what is, what is Samuel Wesley saying to John Wesley? In short, you're being selfish. You're being selfish. You should take these parishes uh, and then continue uh, this ministry. Uh, well, Samuel Wesley failed here, so Interestingly enough, he turns to Sam Jr., who is his oldest son, and he tries to get the older son to put some pressure uh, on John Wesley. And so, like his father, Sam Jr. accused uh, John Wesley, the reluctant Wesley, of self-love, of preoccupation with his own interest, and this is what he wrote. This is Sam Jr. writing to his younger brother. Quote, I see your love to yourself, but your love to your neighbor I do not see. Um, end of quote. Well, beyond this, uh, Sam Jr. contended that Wesley, now, now this is where Sam Jr. is going to strike pay dirt and is going to really strike home and get Wesley's attention 
in a way that his father could not. Here's what he says to John Wesley. He said that when John Wesley was ordained, when he was ordained by Bishop Potter, he had obligated himself to undertake pastoral duties in his ordination vows. Oh, see, now you're, you're playing with conscience here. No, did I? Did I vow that? Did I? Must I do that? So he struck pay dirt here, and Wesley is, you know, he's shaken. Uh, uh, and he begins to make inquiry. He begins to make inquiry. Um, What's, what's rather interesting about this, and I have to give you a little information here about Sam Jr., maybe on some level a little hypocrisy, uh, because Sam Sr. turned to Sam Jr. first and said, would you take these parishes? And Sam Jr. turned down uh, his father. Why? because Sam Jr. was the headmaster at Tiverton Grammar School, a position which he greatly valued. And so there may be a little hypocrisy here because he had already turned down uh, these parishes. Well, as I told you, Wesley is shaken up. You know, he, he's, he's shaken. And so uh, what does he do? He writes to the bishop. He writes to Bishop Potter. Did I so obligate myself in my ordination vows? And so this is how the bishop replied, quote, it doth not seem to me that at your ordination, you engaged yourself to undertake the cure of any parish. The cure meaning, you know, pastoral responsibilities. The cure of any, passion, any parish, the bishop replied providing you can, as a clergyman, better serve God and the church in your present or some other station, end of quote. Well, John Wesley loved that reply, and he forwarded the answer uh, triumphantly to his brother, uh, uh, showing that he had not uh, obligated himself to undertake the pastor pastoral duties of any particular parish so long as he could be otherwise engaged. Well, Sam Sr. kept coming, kept coming uh, at John Wesley, kept persisting, take these parishes. Um, and so finally, uh, John Wesley sits down and writes a letter to his father. And John Wesley could do this to you. Uh, that if you were engaged in controversy, he wrote a letter in which he detailed 20, count them, 20 reasons why he should not, <coughs> not assume these parishes at Epworth and Root. Wesley could do that to you. It's like a barrage. It just keeps coming. <laughs> it just keeps coming. Uh, but two points were integral to his position. First, Wesley, in this correspondence, not only repeats his claim that his own holiness, and therefore that of others, can be best promoted where? At Oxford. But he also offers a sophisticated and even profound definition of holiness as revealed in the following. And so this is what John Wesley is writing to his father, quote, by holiness, I mean not fasting or bodily austerity or any other external means of improvement, but that inward temper. See, we could use the word disposition there as well. Tempers and dispositions are the same thing. So Wesley is saying, but that inward temper to which all these are subservient, a renewal of the soul in the image of God. Again, you know, he's talking about what holiness is. And so he continues in his answer to his father as he describes holiness. I mean a complex habit of lowliness, meekness, purity, faith, hope, and the love of God and man, Wesley writes, and I therefore believe that in the state where I am, I can most promote 
this holiness in myself because I now enjoy several advantages which are almost peculiar to it. And so, in effect, what John Wesley is saying to his father, I don't want to leave Oxford because it is conducive to my growth in, my growth in holiness. Okay. Uh, beyond this, Wesley affirms that Oxford can further his spiritual growth by providing him with, and notice this language here, freedom from trifling acquaintances, uh, as well as the opportunity to be among real Christians. Uh, here's what Wesley writes, quote, uh, and this I bless God, I can in some measure, so long as I avoid that bane of piety, what is the bane of piety? The company of good sort of men, lukewarm Christians, as they are called, persons that have a great concern for, but no sense of religion. But these insensibly undermine all my resolutions and quite steal from me the little fervor that I have. God deliver me from half a Christian. What is Wesley saying here? This is actually very important counsel for Christians. He's saying that who our friends and acquaintances are is an important matter. It's an important matter. Are those friends and acquaintances conducive to the knowledge and love of God? If so, then enjoy these relationships. If they are not, uh, Wesley is going to argue, certainly if there is the intimacy of friendship, he's going to argue that that be put aside even if it's relatives. In other words, you could meet them on occasion, be friendly to them, et cetera, et cetera, but they don't come uh, in terms of an intimacy of conversation. Uh, that is dangerous. That is dangerous. Uh, and he's saying here that that can undermine, and in his case, he's talking about it undermining all his resolutions. Wesley later on will write about friendship. Friendship is a very important issue for Christians. We have to be very careful in terms of who we allow close and who we are friends with and who we are ongoingly so because there is the possibility for influence and transformation. And so that is an important matter. And Wesley's mentioning it here to his father. He will write about it later on when he talks more broadly about friendship. And C.S. Lewis talked about friendship and its importance as well. Very good counsel, very wise counsel. Um, so we see here, once again, the theme of being a real Christian is very important to John Wesley. Uh, it's very evident during this period. Uh, and it will continue throughout Wesley's life with some important modifications along, along the way. Uh, and so we see Wesley here, he's a very, um, he's a complex man in some respects. Uh, he's uh, being governed by his heart as much as by his mind. Uh, he's being sensitive to tempers and dispositions as much as he's being sensitive to the rigors of logic. Um, well, this is going back and forth between father and son. And unfortunately, uh, Samuel Sr. died uh, a little over four months after this letter was delivered to him. Uh, and in the interim, and Wesley could do this. Wesley could do this also. Uh, uh, he would reflect, but then he would hesitate. Uh, but then what does Wesley do? Ah, uh, here comes the surprise. He applied for the parishes, he did. But it was too late because they had been given to another. They had been given to another. And as Samuel Wesley is dying, and John Wesley is at the deathbed of his father. He's at the deathbed of his father. As Samuel, as Samuel Sr. lay dying, uh, he spoke to John, not of parishes or of legacies, 
nor of the obedience required of a son. Instead, he whispered as he was dying. This is what he whispered. The inward witness, my son, the inward witness, this is the proof, the strongest proof of Christianity. Actually, I'm going to repeat that one more time to get the obsessive verba because I actually added a word that's not there. <laughs> so I'm correcting myself. Uh, quote, the inward witness son, the inward witness, that is the proof, the strongest proof of Christianity. But John understood him not. <laughs> What is Samuel Wesley? What is Samuel Wesley referring to here? He's referring, as Paul talks about, as Paul writes about in Romans 8, the witness of the Spirit with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so Samuel Wesley is dying, and as he is dying, he's giving evidence of what? He's giving evidence of Christian assurance. That assurance that Paul talks about, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are a child of God, okay? And so John Wesley doesn't understand all this at, at this point, but this is the way that Samuel Sr. Uh, is passing, is passing away. Um, <clears throat> now, shortly before, shortly before uh, Samuel Wesley, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, why don't we take questions? Because I'm about to start a new section and we, we can leave some generous time for questions here. Uh, so, what questions do you have? Questions or comments? Questions, comments about anything that I've said? Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, when we look at John Wesley, <coughs> excuse me, in 1729, when the Oxford, the rise of Oxford Methodism, we know that we know that Wesley is serious and earnest uh, about the Christian life. We also know, because of what we said about 1725, that he understands the end or goal of religion, which is holiness. Um, but the peace of faith, saving faith, and what saving faith actually is, and to understand that, not only to understand it, but to participate in it, in saving faith, that is something that will happen later on for John Wesley, okay? So, he obviously is sincere, he is earnest, he's an earnest Christian, a sincere Christian, but he has not yet realized all that he desires. And he'll tell us so. He'll tell us so in his letters. And then when he goes to Georgia and, be, and is writing his journal, he'll tell us there in his journal as well that he has not you know, realized what, uh, all that he wants, all that he desires in terms of the proper Christian faith or, or what the real Christian faith is. So that's a very good question. Yes, thank you. Others? Other questions, comments? Yes. Yeah, the Wesley will meet the Moravians, and we're headed there. We're headed there. This is where we're going. Wesley is going to meet the Moravians first. Uh, on board the Simmons. This is a ship that will take him from England to Georgia, to the colony of Georgia, and on board he will meet the Moravians. And once Wesley meets the Moravians, his dialogue with this community is ongoing. 
And, you know, I would argue in my reading of the life and thought of John Wesley that the Moravians had an important influence upon him and helped to correct some of the theological mistakes that Wesley was making uh, during this period of time, uh, okay? Uh, so the Moravians are very important. Um, their voice in the story is going to come a little later. It's gonna come a little later, yeah. Uh, Wesley has not yet signed up to become a missionary to Georgia. He's about to do so. That's actually where we left off. He's about to do so, yeah. Um, other questions, comments? Yes, yes, go ahead. В этом клубе, где собирался его брат и он и другие, эти мужчины, они уже были рожденные свыше. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, in a sense, uh, you know, I've, I've dealt with this issue in answering the other woman. Um, because, yeah, because here, when we talk about what is real Christianity, true Christianity, in other words, not being half a Christian, going beyond nominal Christianity, um, there are going to have to be a number of things in place, a number of things in place. Um, we can speak about that theologically, and we will talk in the theological part of the course in this way, that a real Christian is justified, um, meaning they have received the forgiveness of sins. They are free, therefore, from the guilt of sin because Christ has made atonement for them, for their life. So that would be one part of it. They would have received the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Wesley, for example, in his Aldersgate narrative, uh, will write about Christ dying for me, even me, meaning it's, it's personal, not just Christ died for the sins of the whole world, which Christ did, but Christ died for me, John Wesley. See, that kind of language, which we see in the Aldersgate narrative, theologically, that is justification. That is the reception of the forgiveness of sins. My conscience is clean, my, uh, the guilt is gone because Christ has paid it all, and I've received that. That's the first thing. The second thing, and this is what's not in place. See, maybe you'll, you'll hear this and you'll come to understanding because I know you're struggling with this difference between an almost Christian and a real Christian. And Wesley even wrote a sermon on that called The Almost Christian. Uh, the second is the new birth, regeneration. What do we mean by that? Regeneration, again, it's another freedom. Just as justification was freedom from the guilt of sin, regeneration is freedom from its power or dominion. In other words, it's freedom from the power and dominion of sin such that one is walking by grace through faith in this new power. Uh, and, and, and what that means is the roller coaster cycle that we talked about yesterday, sinning, repenting, sinning, repenting, sinning, repenting, calling that the Christian life is gone. That something new has come, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives where we can walk, and it is a walk, it's a daily walk, we can walk in the strength and the vigor, the graces of regeneration, and thereby, and Wesley will, talk about this in several of his sermons, to be free from the power and dominion of sin. And then thirdly, uh, a part of being a real Christian, a scriptural Christian, as opposed to a nominal Christian, would be this element that Samuel Sr. gave testimony to, assurance, uh, Christian assurance, the witness of the spirit with our spirit that we are a child of God. In other words, uh, that God doesn't leave us in the dark. God lets us know that we are the sons and daughters of God by the spirit that God gives us. Paul talks about that. Paul says, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ is none of his. Uh, and so that is an important 
uh, aspect of being a real Christian. So when we say all those three things, what are we saying? The Christian faith is not simply doctrine. It's not simply orthodoxy, though that's important. But it is, the Christian faith is what? It is a life. It is a life. It is a life. Uh, it is freedom from the guilt of sin, freedom from the power of sin, and assurance that we are the beloved, that we are the children of God. And I have to say this more positively now, that it is freedom to love God and to love our neighbor as we should, okay? It's, so there's a negative freedom, freedom from, freedom from guilt, freedom from power and dominion, <coughs> excuse me, but freedom to, freedom to love God and neighbor. Who is the person who is free of all? Who is the most free? The one who is free to love God, to love God above all, uh, and then to love the neighbor as oneself, unfettered by envy, by jealousy, any sort of self-absorption, self-curvature, to be free of that. But to love God, love our neighbor, all of this will be involved in what Wesley means by real, true, proper, scriptural Christian. 1729, this is not in place. How do I know? Wesley tells us so. He tells us in his journal, especially in Georgia, here's Wesley's language. It's pretty close to an exact quote. I'm a little paraphrasing here, but he's talking about sinning. He's talking about being under the power and dominion of sin. And he uses language to the effect, I, I, I fell, I rose, I fell again. And this is his life. It, you know, he describes his life in Georgia. I fell, I rose, I fell again. Some people in the church are, are saying, this is all you can hope for. This is the Christian life. This is it. Rising, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling. John Wesley says, no, it's not. No, it's not. So he had the humility, and it is humility. I, this is what I like about John Wesley. He's teachable. See, see some people are not teachable. You, you can't teach them anything new because they think they already know it. They don't know what they don't know. John Wesley, especially through his experiences in Georgia, becomes teachable. Why? Because he's broken. His Georgia ministry breaks him up in lots of ways. He is open to learning something new. And this is where the Moravians are going to come in in a strong way. So 1729 or in Georgia, does, has Wesley realized what he has seen? You know, uh, back in 1725, this holiness, the end or goal of religion, which is holiness? No, he has not realized this in his life yet. And how do I know? Not, not my view. It's Wesley's own words. If we pay attention to what he wrote in his letters, if we pay attention to what he wrote in his journal, okay? Yeah, yeah. Question back here. Um, короткий просто комментарий, наверное. Вот, э, не случайно вот, сестра задала вопрос, но очень серьезный те в теологическом плане. Вот вопрос рождения свыше. Потому что вот, ну, мои наблю наблюдения да, вот, э, в наших э, деноминациях христианских, вообще этот вопрос очень размытый. Он, он просто плавает. Вот, например, вот, например у баптистов, у них концепция такая, что ну, покаялся, тут же и родился свыше, и получил сразу ну, крещение Святым Духом, то есть все в одном флаконе. Ну а так не бывает. То есть мы это видим по Писанию, что это не так. То есть есть конкретно ступени. И вот, ну, как бы вот это надо четко понимать. И вот на мой взгляд, мне кажется, что эта тема очень ну, слабо освещается. То есть, ну, либо все смешали, и все, да, и не освещается вот именно как бы пошаговость. Вот. Поэтому вот вопрос очень серьезный. Вот. И, конечно, если предстоящий yes. кейс, ну, неплохо, если вы бы ну, это, ну, уделили внимание, вот, ну, как бы, ваше. Yes, uh, we will do that. Uh, this is where the course is heading. This is where the course is heading. But I can say this right now. I'll say this right now, uh, that John Wesley addressed this issue. 
pointedly, this very issue that you're raising. In other words, how do I know that I am a real Christian, a, a real, true, proper, scriptural Christian? Um, he wrote two sermons. The first, listen to the title, The Marks of the New Birth. In other words, there are marks, there are characteristics, there are traits that will you know, mark a child of God. We can look at those. We can look at those very clearly. Uh, and so Wesley talked about the direct witness of the Holy Spirit, which I just referred to, but there's also the indirect witness. The indirect witness uh, coming through such things as conscience, coming through such things as the fruit in our lives, coming in terms of the evidences of obedience, walking in faith. But even beyond that, there are definite marks of the new birth, and so we can get an understanding. And then Wesley wrote another sermon called The Great Privilege of Those Who Are Born of God. Uh, and again, Wesley is filling out, so there'll be no misunderstanding, uh, what it is to be a child of God. And so he's going to lay out all the traits, all the marks, all the characteristics that should be in the life of the real, true, proper, scriptural Christian, uh, in other words. Now, that doesn't mean <clears throat> then that you know, all churches and traditions agree with this because different traditions think about this differently. Wesley realized that problem in the 18th century. And he believed that one of the reasons why Methodism was being raised up was to spread scriptural holiness throughout the land. Now, what did that mean? Wes John Wesley believed that what was being taught in some churches, yes, left people in their sins, in their bondages. And he called that antinomianism. And Wesley's ministry in part was to help those people, to lead them into all the graces for which Christ died, okay? And so Wesley's ministry uh, is both to the church itself. That's an important point to realize. In other words, Wesley is saying to the church, you're not living up to the gospel. You're not holding up the freedoms of the gospel. You, you're engaged, you're leaving people in the ongoing power and dominion of sin, and you're not troubled by it. That should be very disturbing. And so Wesley is ever opposed to antinomianism, this lawlessness, basically. Uh, and then he has a ministry not only in the church, but beyond the church as well. This means then that Methodism today, for instance, 21st century, has a ministry to all the theological traditions, uh, reminding them what is the end or goal of religion, which is holiness, spreading scriptural holiness across the land. So thank you. Thank you for your question.